Welcome everyone. Uh, this panel is for APAC FinTech uh, landscape and we have prominent speakers from various countries joining us today. So let me briefly introduce them. We have Simon, an influential FinTech innovator servicing as global CEO and co-founder of PayPal Play. Plain, a revolution, a revolutionizing security and reliability of recurring payments worldwide. Additionally, her role as chair of FinTech Australia underscores her commitment to progressive industry regulations reflected in multiple advisory positions in, within Australia payment ecosystems. Now, based in New York, Simone is in the forefront of Paper Plains International Growth, continuing her advocacy for robust and fair and innovative financial ecosystem. We also have Nikki. Uh, Nikki uh, uh, is cornerstone in India, uh, Indonesia's fintech landscape with over decade experience in shaping payments, fintech, and public policy. He is driving force behind Vida uh, as a founder and group CEO. His foundational role in the International Fintech Association, combined with his strategic advisory positions for fintech and financial inclusion initiatives, highlights uh, his uh, dedication to nourishing the dynamics and including inclusivity in fintech uh, environments within Indonesia. We also have Naveen. Naveen is a prominent leader in Indian fintech industry. Naveen Surya has committed his reputation as an investor, founder, mentor, advisor, board member, as well as a thought leader. His strategic positions, including uh, most notable, including Fintech Governance Council, Payments Council of India, and Global Fintech Festival, uh, sparks volumes of his uh, speaks volumes of his influence. A serial entrepreneur, Naveen's extensive portfolio encompasses numerous ventures along with his various advisory roles, including Reserve Bank of India FinTech Department. We also have Lito today with us. Lito stands as a beacon of digital transformation and financial inclusions in Philippines, holding uh, an ex executive vice president and chief innovation and uh, inclusion officer position at RCBC Bank. He has propelled the bank's digital prominence with uh, trailblazing projects like Discard Tech app and more. His thought leadership has earned him global recognition and numerous accolades, further solidifying his roles within FinTech Alliance.ph and various prestigious advisory councils. With that, uh, I'll go into the uh, core discussions uh, for this forum. Now, uh, in our various countries, the FinTech ecosystem is influenced by various components, let it be economic components, let it be cultural components, let it be talent in that uh, country within, within the emerging tech dimensions, as well as pillars, investor community, and so on. So the idea here is to try to bring in various um, uh, dimensions and get a high level view from the respective thought leaders in those countries uh, from their vantage point. And this will be a very high level, but it will have uh, uh, the, the history and the current and the future state of the respective uh, uh, countries here. Now, why do we want to do this uh, in this forum is because we have our audience, which is uh, the IN48 partner edition participant startups who are in scaling mode right now. And many of them have uh, the theme of expanding to other geographies. And this session is uh, for these startups who are uh, already having some level of investment, some level of traction in the current country, a uh, good amount of uh, uh, market and product fit, and they're looking for scale scaling globally and within the Asia Pacific region with help of larger uh, players like FIS. Uh, I'll give you one of the examples how uh, the story will get unpacked. For example, in India, the story has been always starting with digital public infrastructure, which is a kind of a role model for the entire world, uh, which essentially uh, at some point of time was non-existence and recently it has become kind of a leader in that space and with help of with addition to that mobile penetration digital literacy and data rich environments that we have are growing prominently in India and that is shifting the focus from the older ways to uh, new opportunities into how these startups can become enterprise uh, plumbing uh, focused uh, rather than uh, just B2C focused. And we have shift uh, from digital to digital physical and then AHA, UPI, AA, ONDC, and OCN uh, have become kind of a central theme for India's uh, fintech ecosystem development. So similarly, uh, we are going to unfold other regions and try to understand the nitty from the respective leaders. So I'll start with Simon first. Simon, Australia has been a highly developed, mature fintech market with robust regulatory support and it has also the advanced technology infrastructure. 
Uh, it does also have a lot of customer trust in digital services and a strong wealth tech alternative finance space there. So from your vantage point, uh, how do you see the key drivers shaping up fintech uh, ecosystem in Australia? A uh, bit of a past, current, and the future in a very brief uh, manner that will be really helpful. Over to Simon. Thank you, Prashant. Great to be here this morning. So Australia has come through a few years of advancement in regulation for fintech and the supporting infrastructures that are driving, um, I suppose, the development of how fintechs are rolling out in that, in, in that country. In 2018, we switched on our real-time payment system called the NPP or the New Payments Platform Australia. It was off to a slow start because the message set for the MPP was really focused on peer-to-peer -peer transactions, so push payments from one account to the other. Um, that's where a lot of fast payment systems start, and it's um, pretty normal that Australia started in that way as well. The difference with Australia being it's quite difficult to access the MPP, um, meaning that to access the payment facilities and to be able to take advantage of those payments, you really needed a supportive partner um, who was connected directly as a participant being the banks. At the same time, Australia was having a, um, a bit of a look at how banks were interacting with payment service providers. And there was a real pullback on how and when um, they were willing to support those service providers. That resulted around 2019 with a lot of um, payment um, providers looking for a partner as lots of banks off-boarded them. Um, also around that same time, our consumer data right legislation rolled out. Consumer data right was the legislation that decided that data belonged to the consumer who was generating it. And um, providers such as banks were the custodians of that data, and therefore the consumer should have the right to share that with trusted third parties as they choose. So open banking in a nutshell. The consumer data right in Australia goes a little bit broader than banking. It is designed to go into other sectors um, related to fintech, such as superannuation. It has rolled out into utility providers, and we are just looking at rolling it out into non-bank lenders. So thinking about implications on buy now, pay later, or smaller lending houses that may be fintechs, that might come in scope for that open banking um, sharing. So that's got benefits in that fintechs are able to start looking at richer data sets and taking more implications from the consumer's broader financial life. But it does have restrictions too, meaning that if you are a fintech looking at providing loan services, you may want to um, ensure that you are or are not in scope for that um, continued consumer data right rollout. Fast forward a little bit, and the NPP has developed pay to and pay to is the request for payment service on top of the underlying rails. And that's created more opportunity for fintech in that you can um, connect and send those non-value payment messages, request for payments over the top of the settlement rails, meaning there's more entry points for fintech in that market. Alongside this, we've seen the consumer data right continue to go through rules changes. We are at a little bit of a pause, I think, um, in our consumer data right and open banking journey. We've had a very regulated approach and um, a regulated driven focus for how that's rolling out. That's had its advantages in that every bank needs to be compliant with a set of rules and be able to share data as requested. But I think we're now seeing a little bit of a pause as everyone starts to figure out how to commercialise that underlying capability and how to do that within the legislation and the rules-driven approach that we've taken. <clears throat> On the payment side, we're seeing a payment regulation review happen in Australia, which means that we are going to start contemplating activities such as payment initiation as part of a payment regulated environment. This will mean that some companies that are operating in an unregulated re regulated space now will need to be regulated. And as with all regulation, this will create pathways for new companies to enter into the country through the compliant regulation streams. Um, I think that's probably a, a bit of a wrap in a nutshell about where the opportunities are and where the key drivers have been um, for that ecosystem. Uh, Simon, just a quick follow-up. Uh, Australia also has seen uh, some interesting uh, kind of... Uh, uh, growing interest in the blockchain and cryptocurrency solutions uh, there. And uh, would you like to comment on those areas and how that may be, uh, 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 let's say, placed from regulatory aspects as well? Mm. 
Yes, so Australia, like many jurisdictions around the world, has been um, puzzling with how to appropriately regulate blockchain and um, and assets held in blockchain situations. We've just released some um, regulation for consultation, um, I think two weeks ago, that um, really contemplated how to regulate regulate tokenized assets um, from early. From an early read through, and this is not my sector of expertise, but my understanding is that it is welcomed by the blockchain and crypto communities in Australia as being appropriate regulation. Um, however, I think there will be some expense for compliance. So we might see some consolidation at the smaller players in that market um, as they prepare to have the um, ability to comply with those regulations. And hopefully we'll also see some more um, sustainable growth as a result of that with consumers um, appropriately protected in the environment. Thanks, Simone. So uh, now let's move, move to the Nikki. Nikki, uh, Indonesia uh, has a significant unbanked population and has surge in mobile penetration. And this has created a lot of opportunities for uh, payment, lending, and remittance landscape here. There's a, a huge activity on the e-wallet space as well in peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, so uh, will you uh, give us some overarching uh, kind of a bird's eye view about uh, Indonesia fintech ecosystem and what are the key drivers there uh, and uh, how exactly the past, current and future will evolve there. So I'll try and do this quickly. Um, 2016, we formed the fintech association, the Indonesian fintech association. Roughly at the time, predominantly payments players, 60 out of 100 players. Um, we formed it. It started with a group of core group of 20. Um, if you look at now, there's over 360 players. There's been consolidation in payments. There's over 100 players in peer-to-peer -peer lending. So a big boom in online lending, a big boom in buy now, pay later, a big boom in the e-money wallet space. Um, e-money space, we have over 460 million e-money subscribers. Um, and that really all, you know, quote unquote, started in 2016. So there's been a tremendous amount of uh, growth. And a lot of that we believe is, and we, you know, as an industry, we chose to take a very proactive uh, approach in working together with the regulators and, uh, and the Indonesian FinTech Association in 2019 uh, became, was appointed a self-regulatory organization by the Financial Services Authority. And I think that was really a big turning point that we could work with a high level of trust between industry and um, and regulators. And we're very proactive. And we actually self-funded and resourced the association, including governance committees, ethics committees, especially in lending. There's quite a lot of issues that you can face in terms of risks around consumer protection, around lending practices, around you know excessive interest rates. So there's quite a lot of areas that we have proactively addressed. And I think that has helped um, build a lot more trust in the ecosystem. Uh, moving forward, of course, the consumer tech platforms, all the super apps uh, moving into digital banking. Uh, a few have launched already and have had quite a lot of traction, you know, uh, consumer bases of over 10 million accounts a piece. And there's still more uh, digital banks coming onto the market. So it's uh, still an exciting time in Indonesia. There's a lot of ecosystem plays, of course, as uh, consumer acquisition costs are now, you have to be a lot more mindful given the, the funding environment. And uh, yeah, I think this is where, you know, from a FinTech association and industry point of view, uh, we proactively address a lot of infrastructure issues. As you mentioned earlier, you know, digital infrastructure took a few pages from from India, from the India stack. And, uh, and I think this is where we work quite closely with the regulators through the key pressing issues back then in 2016 was KYC you know, having to do it face to face and wet signatures and the need for a biometric remote EKYC and the need for digital signatures. They eventually came into law in 2019. And, uh, and actually that ended up being the premise for my new startup. I was in payments before, um, and exited to Gojek, uh, exited into the wallet and, uh, yeah, exciting time in Indonesia now. A lot going on in digital identity, digital signatures. Um, I think the, the security standards are still catching up. Um, but open banking, um, more on the payment side, is, is definitely moving forward quite quickly. And 
and definitely fast payments, et cetera, is, is already a thing of the current today. But I think where things will become more interesting is, you know, as, as more uh, government authoritative sources and data sources come online, and especially things like uh, working together with the director generals of tax and income tax information being able to come online, very similar to the account aggregator position in India, there, I think, will be more and more opportunities to uh, penetrate the underserved. Um, technically, now more than 90% are quote unquote banked, but that's usually defined by pure access as opposed to usage and quality of services. So, uh, still a long way to go. Um, definitely more than $70 billion uh, under penetrated in the SME segment. Um, so, we still have a lot of work to do, but there's a, a lot of progress on the infrastructure and regulatory front, which I think has helped catalyze the industry in Indonesia. Thanks, Nikki. So now let's move to Naveen. So Naveen, uh, uh, you, you have seen uh, enormous uh, consumer base in India with increased mobile connectivity and digital literacy, uh, alongside with the, the, the strong support from digital public infrastructure goods there or uh, digital public infrastructure, account aggregator, and various other systems, OKIN, ONDC, uh, are capturing the uh, essence of the FinTech, uh, and there's a lot of build that is happening on top of it. So uh, from your vantage point, can you describe uh, uh, India uh, FinTech, uh, kind of a past, current, and future evolution that you can see from yeah. your vantage point? Uh, so sure, sure. I think uh, Sam. So I've been kind of part of the ecosystem since year two thousand when the word fintech wasn't coined. It was largely digitizing or non-bank institutions doing something in financial services. It was also time when there was a bit of a tug of war somewhere around two thousand six eight. But fundamentally, let's look at decade and a half where each of these developments that you talked about has happened. So two thousand seven eight. Let's cut to that. Uh, that's when the first time formally a government passed a bill called Payments and Settlement Systems Act. And that started, let's say, putting the whole central bank's focus on bringing the non-tech or a non-bank or, a, let's say, individual entities into fintech fold or a financial services domain. Uh, 2011 is when it got implemented. Uh, if you look at the data that time, where we were as, an, as a country, if you look at probably payments, we were just about spending less than 2% in digital or electronic payments of the entire spend in the country. Uh, probably the banking side, we were somewhere around 20-25% of the adult population. If you look at, uh, let's say, lending side, will be very early digit or to the GDP ratios in terms of a digital lending, it has hardly started. And if you look at insurance and investment, there's hardly any play in terms of, uh, let's say, digital and consumer participation. Uh, though a lot of back-end technology implementation has started because the NSC had digitized a lot of uh, let's say processes at the back end, they started becoming already one of the largest uh, players when it came to options, futures, derivative markets. So a lot of developments have happened on those sides. But on the consumer side, penetration was extremely low. And that's where the opportunity actually started coming in. So obviously, RBI took initiative, so did SEBI and few other regulators. So for those who don't know about India, India has three large regulators, uh, which actually drives the financial services. We have RBI, Central Bank, which drives all the lending, banking, payment side of it. SEBI, which is all the security side, trading side. Uh, when we have a insurance IRDA who controls the insurance, we have a PFRDA which does pension, but not much has happened. We have fourth one, which has recently come, which is uh, called IFSCA, which is only for a gift city, which is seen as a, you could say, offshore zone where you could even do. So rest of the country is an exchange control zone, but there you could actually do trade in our dollars. You could maintain your dollar balance is like a 100% convertible zone. So that's a new development in the last two years. So broadly, that's where we started. If you look at today where we are, right? Today, when you look at fast payments, and I'm not going into details, Prasant, of each of those initiatives. I'm sure somebody has already covered it, right? Uh, based on what has happened in last seven to eight years, especially starting from UIDI to everything else, UPI, I think we all know. Today, we are leaders in the fast payment across the globe, thanks to IMPS and UPI both, and NPCI being an institution behind it. Uh, we are the second largest ecosystem when it comes to fintech entrepreneurs, I think, across the globe in terms of number of uh, startup entities that are doing fintechs. On the whole, as an entire ecosystem, whether it's a talent, whether it's everything you put together, we are third largest. And if you just compare it to, let's say, traditional financial services, it took us probably 75 plus years to even produce one bank, which could figure out in the top 10 across the globe, right, which is SDFC Bank now. But if you look at fintech, we are already there in a lot of areas. 
the growth is extremely high extremely high if you look at also a couple of other statistics for an example the adoption rate in india for fintech services and consumers it's very high at 68% and why is it so because of the demography the average age of the people the access to the technology the infra that has happened because of the the whole public digital infrastructure so all of this coming together has created a very interesting ecosystem and also i would say india has a unique advantage that we have a very high net worth individual population as well as extremely poor which is bottom of the pyramid while that population is gradually growing so we also say the classic structure of indian economy in terms of demography which was a pyramid it's likely to change in solid shifting in a shape of diamond so we have a middle bulging out and it's thanks to a lot of things happening india becoming 10th largest economy to 5th moving towards 3rd so a lot of interesting thing happening and again cross section of our talent which is of a very high tech and also very high financial services domain experts so if you combine no reason i mean this is the result that we are right and if i just overlay some of the work that we've done from association to association where i've been personally involved 2007 8 we formed payment council of india which has everybody as a member literally from the ecosystem uh, while the numbers are around 150 purely for digital payments player but in terms of value and a volume we control 95% plus the payment volume in the in the country as well as the value uh we started about 5 years back for the rest of the ecosystem called fintech convergence council which i currently chair uh again has been kind of focusing on rest of the areas and today again we have about 200 plus members in those side and we all work together there are a lot of policy work that has happened i could relate a lot of points to uh, what nikki said because we've seen very similar evolution right from identity to video K- kyc interventions to very similar thing and again recently the thought leadership platform that we did as a cfp so from here where do we see right going forward the india so we are at a stage where there are still a lot of things happening the penetration today in the market if you see we are at about close to 25% in payment but still physical cash is growing if you look at banking we are about at 50% of the population at a, which is actively banking but still minds to go if you look at uh, lending i think we are 10x behind china from a gdp to lending ratio right so again there's a miles to go if you look at investment which has uh, we saw actually huge boom during the covid days but still we are about 3 to 4% of the retail participation when it comes to online trading in the country you look at insurance you're talking early again 2 to 3% digits so you go into any area the market potential is so high and with indian economy growing and as i said uh, middle class growing bulging out it's a huge hot bat for actually in terms of the real growth and that's where we see that any business that have gone into whether even listed space whatever has happened in the market none of them have seen decline in the business they are all growing very rapid because of this whole fundamental growth opportunity in the market now some of the new concepts that have come from the regulator side see uh, cbdc i think the is something which has just started pilot stage we see that making a impact in next 3 to 5 years probably as big as upi or maybe even bigger because that's directly competing with physical cash not necessarily upi right same way we are seeing account aggregator which is an early stage you have already talked about onc uh, only see we have the consumer protection bill has a, sorry the act has just passed so there are a lot of implica- implications around what is have to happen around privacy law a lot of work has to happen there so that's again new area so if you look at international remittances as a area credit card as a area if you really go deeper down into individual product the scope is so high and you see continuous growth happening so if you look at forward side if you are in india i broadly say always three sides of the fintech one which where you own the license and you control the consumers and you own the customers you have an opportunity today there are multiple licenses that you could acquire from any of these regulators we talk about distribution huge play i mean even if you don't have a license all you need to do is collaborate and partner if you have a model where you can use technology to deliver goods and services or a financial product to a larger mass again you have a huge opportunity and lastly the tech platforms we all know that globally the tech platforms that people are using whether it's for a credit cards or a banking or a core banking they are all banded i mean they just just kind of not work they are clunkier so there are new companies who are building new platforms they are doing amazingly well and there is more demand so a lot more entities we are seeing coming up with new platforms whether for lending side whether for payment side whether for core banking side so there are all kind of applications getting developed so i see huge opportunity for that ecosystem to collaborate work in partnerships or just take probably things from here and export out to other countries so that's briefly i would kind of stop here and then maybe we take more in the questions thanks navin so uh let's move to lito so lito uh in the philippines you're seeing 
Uh, Philippine has a strong uh, country in the South Asian fintech scheme, and Philippines seems to be high uh, uh, engagement in the digital payments and remittance solutions, right? So uh, there's a concrete push towards financial inclusion, leveraging its mobile first population, and developing regulatory sandbox models there. So Lito, uh, can you ex uh, give us kind of a bird's eye view of Philippine fintech ecosystem uh, from the past, current, and future, kind of a recap here? Thank you, Prashant, and uh, good evening uh, from the Philippines. Um, definitely, the Philippines has been a uh, you know uh, full of so many good news pertaining to the development of fintech landscape, and Philippines being uh, practically an emerging uh, Asia's uh, digital hotspot when it comes to digital finance uh, ecosystem development. So, I think one of the things that we I would like to highlight here is the fact that. Uh, Philippines would have, uh, you know, would be lucky to have, be lucky to be to have uh, the most progressive and dynamic regulator, uh, and that is the Banco Central ng Pilipinas or the Central Bank of the Philippines, because we have quite a number of uh, uh, trailblazing or uh, innovative uh, regulations that would further uh, promote. Uh, uh, innovations, no, and uh, to further push um, massive digitalization and financial inclusion. So one of which would def definitely be on open banking or open finance. Uh, in fact, that is uh, already an um, over uh, what do you call it? oversight, no, uh, finance uh, open finance oversight uh, uh, framework, no, uh, that has already been uh, pushed or promoted by the BSP as well as the open as well as the digital banking uh, framework wherein we now have about six digital bank license, uh, licensees um, and would eventually be um, you know there is a, a moratorium set by the BSP for a period of three months but it seems that the BSP or the regulator is now uh, uh, you know reconsidering that three-year moratorium given the fact that there are uh, quite a number of interested players uh, to be, you know, to be part of that uh, digital banking ecosystem in the Philippines. And aside from that, uh, we have quite a number of uh, virtual asset uh, service providers, or these are the digital assets uh, companies, no, uh, providing, you know, blockchain or cryptos uh, in the Philippines. And you know that Philippines uh, is now regarded to be the second uh, largest uh, country in the world with the highest adoption to crypto. So I think uh, these are some of the initiatives, and at the same time, uh, the other good news would be uh, being able to fulfill the twin goals set by the regulator pertaining to the digital payments transformation roadmap, where it aims to uh, convert at least 50% of retail financial transactions to digital and onboard 70% of adult population to the formal financial system. Uh, by end of this year. And as I've said, the good news is that we will be able to fulfill those twin goals before the end of this year. So, and the, again, thanks to the collective effort of all the players in the industry. And in fact, uh, one of, uh, you know, the Philippines is poised to become a one trillion US dollar economy by 2033. And that is according to S&P Global Market Intelligence. And in fact, our president, Philippine president, Marcos, uh, made a statement during his State of the Nation address in July that the digital economy in the Philippines uh, has registered to, uh, has registered approximately 35 billion uh, US dollars uh, in terms of digital value or the, uh, what we call the digital economy in the Philippines uh, as a as contribution to this to our uh, to our GDP and I think these are some of the uh, positive things uh, or exciting. Uh, news uh, that I would like to share with our audience, because as I've said, um, FinTech Alliance has been in existence since 2017, and FinTech Alliance has been the first and the largest organization of digital, of digital players in the Philippines, comprised of startups and unicorns, collectively generating over 95% of FinTech or digital financial transactions volume in the Philippines today. So we have the likes of Gcash, Maya, Home Credit, Grab, etc. in the FinTech Alliance um, uh, you know, uh, organization. And in fact, Prashant, I just would like to also promote here that the FinTech Alliance will be mounting its first and largest uh, 
the Philippines Country Pavilion at the Singapore FinTech Festival this coming November 15 to 17. And I just would like to invite all our audience uh, if they will be uh, joining or participating uh, the SFF uh, this uh, coming month. I hope you'll be able to visit us at all five. Uh, we will have the biggest pavilion there, of course, after Singapore <laughs> being the host country uh, at 150 square meter space. So I hope to see you there uh, once you are in, uh, in the SFF. And of course, a lot of things are happening uh, in terms of having to collaborate with all uh, with key asso uh, fintech associations. In fact, we are uh, launching uh, the the Asia Fintech Alliance uh, during the SFF, uh, and we will definitely Indonesia Fintech Association is part of that. Uh, and we will also be signing, uh, you know, another agreement or MOU with uh, the Australian Embassy or the Australian Government. And I hope the Australian Fintech Association will also be part of that uh, during the SFF. So these are the things. Uh, that will that that make that make the Philippines a very interesting and exciting destination for fintech players. Thanks, Lito. I think uh, in the last thirty minutes we have gone through uh, extremely interesting and dense conversation, and I'm sure that the staffs will need to rewind it and see and synthesize that. But uh, if we see the uh, underlying patterns here, uh, so essentially it's, it's an, all about how do we create the fintech uh, infrastructure from regulators as well as the policymakers, and then how uh, that essentially gets used, for example, on the identity side, and then how that identity generates the data and link the data, and then regulators protecting the interest of consumers on those uh, uh, data pieces, and then how that data is essentially getting enriched as well as used on lending side and mul multiple other use cases there. So uh, obviously, this space is not uh, uh, like uh, uh, it's also having many challenges as, as well. So let's trace back from this point again back. So Lito, I'll start with you. Uh, it is great to see all the positive aspects here. But uh, from Philippine ecosystem, what are the challenges that you see uh, that fintechs are facing today? Where exactly you believe uh, more efforts needed are needed here? And I'm sure that a lot of efforts are already gone, but uh, every ecosystem has its own uh, challenge, its own uh, areas to reach there. So uh, from your vantage point, Lito, what do you believe Philippine is uh, 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 having challenges with from the fintech angle? I'm sure these challenges are more or less similar in every region, but if you can elaborate on those areas a bit, uh, that would be great. You know, uh, I think this is not only a case for the Philippines, but yeah. I think we've seen uh, the very limited inflow of uh, VCs, no, or potential funding uh, for uh, for fintech players, especially uh, right after COVID. Right, uh, I think that uh, investment, uh, you know, uh, winter uh, would last for the next two to three years more, and I think uh, that's why we need to have those. Uh, uh, funding support or uh, you know investments uh, coming from various uh, you know from various uh, areas where uh, you know our, our startup companies uh, in the Philippines would be uh, you know would 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 probably need uh, at this at this point in terms of having to scale their operations. But I think the other item as well is uh, is really on having to um, engage all the stakeholders. But I think one thing with Philippines is that uh, we have a very progressive, as I've said, uh, uh, ecosystem or uh, stakeholders, right? So I think uh, in terms of being able to engage government and the private sector, I don't think that would be a problem or an issue, especially for investors who would want to come in into the Philippines. Thanks, Lito. So uh, same question, Navin, to you. Uh, although we have seen tremendous uh, support, growth, and excitement in uh, uh, India fintech landscape. What do you think are the still the areas which need to be worked upon or are still unsolved uh, from your vantage point? No, so I think it's a very interesting question. So first of all, I don't think anybody has a ready answer that what needs to be a perfect fintech ecosystem, right? Because it's an evolving landscape. And obviously, there's no past precedence that you could look at in any country. Thankfully, some areas, India has a vantage point of a probably leading, but not all the areas. Interestingly, one thing that has happened because we have a multi-regulator. So we have we have one advantage that we have a one regulator for one sector and it's across the country, which means you have a license, you can operate throughout the country. But on the other hand, because there are different areas, 
let's say like we said, capital market, the banking, payments, different regulators. So at times there are different rules that govern you. And then the same entity may be exposed to multiple regulators. So what has happened now, which is what you, we can talk uh, something interesting about a central bank, that they've always been a bit of a, you could say that a, a little bit forward looking. So there is an independent fintech department that has come into a play in the last two years. The first job was to look at a framework for regulating fintech. And while they're taking lead on regulating fintechs, which let's say directly controlled by RBI, but they're adding a lot of aspects, even which can touch upon on other regulatory aspect or one which are residual, not covered by anyone. For an example, crypto, right? Uh, so in India, for example, it's an interesting situation. It's it's not illegal, but doesn't have enough regulatory support, right? Or let's say commercial support for it to be feasible. So there has to be a very clear policy. So this department has been tasked to kind of design that. And then there are some operating issues that kind of bring in, for an example, if you're acquiring a customer while well, you can acquire one click, but because different regulators may have some minor nuances different, the same process needs to be repeated for the same different products if they're under different regulators. Very simple example, but these are the aspects which sometimes can affect the experience, the cost and everything else. So these are the areas which are being looked at. One interesting area, which I think Nikki also mentioned, and I think uh, the whole self-regulatory aspect, because we have many entities now doing this work, and then there are a lot of newer ways of doing things. There are probably some newer risk getting created. So parallelly, there is a very high emphasis on creating self-regulatory bodies. So today, the self-regulation happened by the industry association, but on a voluntary basis, they don't have any formal, let's say, recognition by regulators or, let's say, enforcement or a teeth to take action against the culprits or if there are any erring uh, entities. So that's going to change. So again, our association and few other associations are working very closely with the regulators to improve that overall environment for customer protection. And we always know there are always, let's say, one or two bad apples, maybe in thousands, but they can cause a lot of issues, especially when it comes to financial services. So this would be a very important step. And again, we know that Indian demographic, it's easy sometimes to draw a customer in with wrong information, with something being not present correctly. So that becomes a very critical aspect. So while growth opportunities there, funding aspect are reasonably okay in India relatively from the world economy because of the sale market size, the growth that's still happening while there has been some impact. But these are the areas where the next set of evolution that will happen is what is getting looked at. And uh, the industry and the regulators are coming working a lot more closer now. And hopefully next three to five years would create a lot more predictable environment from a policy perspective for all the entities. Uh, thank you, Navin. It does uh, give the, the India challenges on RegTech uh, that we are facing uh, looking at uh, uh, the current uh, startups that we are interacting with, uh, it resonates well with that. So, Nikki, over, over to your innovation uh, fintech ecosystems. Uh, again, the question is similar. Where where do you see the challenges, and uh, uh, what are the investment trends that you see uh, into uh, Indonesia? Where exactly is the focus, and where exactly the pain points? So, I think the similar to what Naveen was saying, I think there's still a lot of work on the regulatory harmonization. There is fundamental laws now for fundamental infrastructure that needs to be in place. Not all of it is well recognized and implemented across all the regulators. And there are a lot of different compartments within regulators. So, not only between the financial services authority, you know, there's the banking unit, the non banking financial institutions, and then there's the capital markets, and then you have central bank managing, of course, um, the payment side of things, as well as some of the large banks. But on top of that, when you kind of go into the Personal Data Protection Acts, you know, this, there's no, uh, this is under the Ministry of ICT. Um, there isn't an independent body yet, uh, although this is something that is potentially a, a work in progress. And when it comes to identity, unlike Indonesia, unlike India, there is no independent Aadhaar. body for, well, it's not so much Aadhaar, but the unique identification yeah. authority of India, right? So structurally, I think this is where um, there are still some challenges to be able to harmonize properly and, and of course, do so on a cross-border basis. Um, there's increasing efforts from Indonesia's central bank um, to do quite a lot on the payments front specifically. Um, so there's quite a lot of work there that is quite promising. Um, so again, there's there's a lot of good work. I think there needs to be a little bit more focus on the harmonization. 
um, because there's still basic questions of are digital signatures legal? You know, or is the biometric KYC okay? You know, and these these are things that actually are very clearly spelled out in constitutional law, all the way to implementing presidential decrees, ministerial decrees, and and down to regulatory um, implementations. But yet, there is still a challenge of socialization. Consumer education doesn't happen overnight, as well. Um, so, especially with the um, you know data controller sort of positions and understanding what happens there from a privacy act, these are still fairly new. I mean, Indonesia only implemented our Personal Data Protection Act last year. So privacy is still a fresh topic. Um, it will still take some time. And I'd say one of the biggest challenges as an industry is actually the mounting issues on, on, the, on a cybersecurity front. So tremendous amount of fraud happening from social engineering, from phishing, um, I, just to name a few, but those two, and and frankly, just you know how simple it is to break an SMS OTP. To be frank, right? So I mean, everyone has this problem, and I think this is where it does take a little bit more collective action. It is uh, resulting we see an increasing pressure because there's real consumer money being lost at scale, and it is is definitely hurting the industry um, across. Everyone, not just fintech, but financial institutions across the board. So I think there there needs to be a, a real step up on the security front, in my opinion. Um, it is a harder topic because it is more technical. And it does tend to, uh, there's a lot more questions that refer to global standards, which I think is a great direction. But I think, it, you know, it does need to move a bit faster. Um, and that's where, you know, especially if you look at, Emerging technologies and face recognition, liveness technology, liveness technologies, they all they all carry their their different challenges as well, as much as they are great. Um, so these are the the different aspects that need to be better weighed into account. I think um security is definitely a lot more challenging than it used to be, and, and I think in the next three to five years will remain so. So to, I think those would be my my key pieces, which frankly, are a bit intertwined. Um, so. Thanks, thank you. That definitely it helps. So, uh, Simon, now coming to you, uh, you have heard from others uh, about the challenges that have, they have seen in their respective countries. Uh, do you see Australia having different set of, uh, and some part you covered in your initial discussion as well, but if you compare and contrast, what do you see as a major top uh, three or top two challenges that you see from your vantage point in Austrian fintech ecosystems? Mm, there are some similarities. I can hear um, listening to everyone else. So I'll, I'll start to um, try and uh, align these into the top one. So first of all, funding. Um, someone mentioned that funding was not a problem um, in their country. It is remaining a challenge for Australia. We're a smaller funding market and we're um, a little bit less mature um, than, than some others as, as we've come to the fintech ecosystem. So you're pretty good in Australia if you're raising a seed, an A, and starting to nibble up into the B, but it would be unusual to find um, a company solely accessing funding at that higher B into C range from Australia. So we're really still looking overseas for those um higher level investors to support the growth of fintechs there. Um, we are going through a bit of a regulatory renaissance in Australia at the moment. We do have a lot of regulators. Harmonisation was a great word to use. And we're starting to see really pulling out a lot of old um, prescriptive regulation as we look to do things simultaneously, like remove checks um, from being named in legislation as a method of payment. When in the next five to seven years, we're looking at decommissioning our old batch-based um, bank account payment system in favour of replacing it with um, faster payments and individual messaging. So that requires some regulatory support as well. Um, we do have a lot of regulators for a lot of different things, but we're starting to see them try and move together in a more cohesive way. I say try, we're at the beginning of that journey. Um, the point on scams and fraud, definitely something that the industry is focusing on heavily here, which I actually see as an opportunity for fintechs who are addressing some gaps in that. So splitting it out into that cybersecurity space, we've seen some very public cybersecurity breaches in the past 12 months in Australia. Optus, um, one of our largest telcos, and Medibank Private, one of our largest health insurers, 
both had really impactful breaches that resulted in the loss of a lot of um, data. That's meant that there is a high level awareness of how a, a fintech is protecting themselves and their, their consumers. This does translate into regulations specifically to protect third party relationships. If you're a vendor to a bank, if you're a fintech providing services to a bank, if you are at a particular level of criticality to that bank, the bank board is going to be interested in the services that you're providing and how you're protecting those services because they are compelled to via a regulator. So that's a really interesting dynamic. Scams, on the other hand, is the more social engineering aspect of people starting to move money um, to the wrong person under false pretenses. And we've really seen a spike in that since our real-time payments has become the default for a lot of banks instead of going to that old um, direct debit processing. Um, Australia's approached that by creating a scam task force and picking um, people from various sectors to represent on that task force. So there is banking, there is payments, there's telco, there's the federal police. The idea is to create a cohesive approach to addressing a lot of the multifaceted reasons um, that scams are so successful. Um, and that is then having an impact on how we think about our privacy regulations. So how easily can banks share information between each other and between those organisations to try and prevent um, the, the bad actors coming in and, and continuing to be in the system? Access to talent um, in India. You mentioned that you've got a lot of um, deep talent. In Australia, we, we're still seeing the back of um, COVID-based restrictions on people coming into the country to, to work in the industry. So talent remains a perpetual challenge uh, for fintechs in Australia, although we're starting to see some easing in that now. Um, and one of our biggest challenges is, I mentioned in, um, in my opening statement, access to payment systems. As a fintech, even if payments are not your, um, your focus of your service, you still need them. And debanking has been a real issue that has been persistent over the past few years. It's a very complicated issue and there are many reasons um, that a bank may choose to no longer provide services. They could cite um, security issues. They could cite change of risk appetite. They could cite... Um, client profile doesn't fit with them any longer but underneath that then there's also concerns about anti-competitive behavior so if you're a loan provider are you actually providing services that are taking um, business away from the bank and then there's um, um, blockchain and, and um, crypto companies have had a really persistent struggle with this as well so trying to address that through some changes in payment service regulation um, through to looking at more awareness of it as an issue. There is no law that compels a bank to bank anyone in Australia. So I think it will continue to be a challenge. Uh, thank you, Simone. Uh, I just would like to uh, react to uh, what Simone said. Sure. No, I think this is actually, I think it seems that this is really, uh, of course, definitely a, a concern for everyone, right? Uh, practically across uh, fintech players across the world, right? So, I mean, we cited practically an issue on cybersecurity. I mean, practically we are at war. We are in a cyber war. I mean, you know, uh, it's not only confined in Israel, Hamas, or Ukraine, Russia, uh, geopolitical tensions, but practically the entire world is at war when it comes to cybersecurity, right? So we've seen a, a series of attacks uh, uh, by, you know, cyber criminals. And that is actually an, an alarming concern for everyone, right? So I think that's why, uh, you know, educational campaign, awareness, uh, you know, uh, programs that would really uh, ensure consumer protection, no? ensuring that every consumer uh, is really aware of, you know, of what's happening around them and how to protect their, their accounts, right? So because at the end of the day, all the players in the industry would really uh, push for uh, having to promote trust in the digital system, right? Because uh, that is the only thing that all players would be collaborating with each other on how to have a united front against cyber criminals. So I think one of the things that I also would like to add to what Simone said, or Simone said, I think the, the trends that will, be, uh, that will be in for 2024 would be, I think would be limited to three items. Now, I think number one would be regulators and government players will prioritize data governance 
data security and privacy protection. I think second would 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 be more focus on ESG, uh, focus fintechs or green or sustainable finance. And I think lastly, uh, accelerating usage of AI and AIGC. When you say AIGC, it's AI generated content for improving customer experience. So I think this would be the exciting trends that we will be watching out for come 2024. And I think that would also be something that uh, our other uh, speakers, you know, our co-panelists would be uh, sharing as well uh, or subscribing or, or agreeing to those, to those trends uh, other than the other uh, concerns in the respective jurisdictions. I, I think the that. other aspect to that, Lito, is, um, you know, if you're a fintech, and I know that there's a lot um, out there who want to serve large enterprise financial institutions, um, that higher end of town, one of the persistent questions that we see is the threshold of um, cyber insurance that the fintech needs to hold. And that is really challenging because there is a restriction in that type of insurance in the market. And the value of that insurance actually you know, what it's going to protect against or, or, you know, help you recompense if there is an event is actually really minimal compared to the price that you're paying to hold that piece of paper in order to get the contract. So I think there's a whole lot of moving pieces um, around that, but I agree with your comments completely. Thanks, Simon. So whenever we have seen challenges, whenever we see difficulties, there are always innovations and innovators coming in and startups essentially bring those ideas and make those um, uh, the sparks, uh, and then essentially they work with the larger enterprises as well as the uh, larger players to uh, scale their innovations there. And Simon, you have seen uh, first with your first and experience with your uh, uh, own company, Paper Play. Uh, I would like to understand what kind of a uh, uh, I say ecosystem in Australia, large enterprises you've seen, where uh, uh, is it easier for startups to work with larger enterprises? either banks or larger product providers like MasterCard, Visa, and others to solve jointly these problems that we just discussed. Uh, how is this ecosystem uh, where collaborative efforts between startups and larger players is evolving in Australia? Well, first of all, I would never say it's easy. I don't think if you're in tech hunting up to work with a financial institution, easy is not on your list of things. Yep. Um, so look, Australia, we... Um, for those who aren't aware, we have four big banks in Australia, and it's actually called the Four Pillar Policy. Um, the government decided some years ago that having four um, really strong banks was a good protective moat around our um, financial position. And then we have a lot underneath that. So when I say a lot, we've got about 350 other banks and financial institutions underneath, underneath that. What I always say about Australia is it's a really good place to grow to start to grow a fintech. The regulator is highly engaged in who the bank interacts with and how they interact with them. You have to have a very good um, operating process and procedure and you need to work that muscle well in order um, to gain those lucrative contracts, those contracts that will give you access to, to services, to consumers, to, um, to revenue. But you also need to have a global plan from day one. So it's not a good plan to scale a fintech to exit velocity, if that's your long-term plan, um, it is a piece of that puzzle. Over the past, I would say, two to three years, we've seen an uptick in how engaged our incumbent institutions are with the fintech community. And that's been driven in part by compliance-based gaps that they need to fill in their products and services. So a few years ago, that was looking at how do we make sure that we can interact appropriately with um, data requests for our open banking and CDR? We're compelled to do that as a bank. How can we do that? Do we build? Do we partner? Do we buy? And a lot of them chose to partner. Then we saw it happening again a couple of years ago with um, Pay2. I mentioned Pay2 earlier. It is the request for pay system over the top of our real-time rails. And all the banks were mandated again to have the payer component ready, you have to be ready to receive a mandate and to have that consumer be able to accept and view and interact with that request for payment. But now we're seeing it swing back around and go, okay, how do we commercialise this? And we saw a lot of banks really looking for partners to how to come in and support the business side of sending those mandates across. Um, so I think that we, we do see gaps 
that partnerships can fill from a compliance perspective in Australia. And now we're starting to come back around and go, okay, um, what other services can we provide? Where are we aligned with the mission of fintechs? And that's a really key one. Um, I think fintechs who are wishing to partner with financial institutions have to be really sure that's what you want to do because it will often leave you with um, not a lot of broader focus to go and attract other clients. So you have to be sure that that's what you're going to do and make investment appropriately into that, into things like cyber insurance, information security protection, making sure your certifications are in place as far as global standards go. Um, and I think that Australia is attractive, not just for financial institutions for fintechs, but we've also got large superannuation companies. We have um, a really robust superannuation or pension scheme in Australia, which is sometimes called in other areas of the world. And insurers, um, we've got some really big and active insurers in Australia who are starting to really think about the challenges of um, right-sizing insurance to the way that we're operating in a more real-time micro-investment type world, um, played off against the fact that we do have some significant um, weather events in Australia that are increasing in their cadence and insurance companies are really looking at how they can make sure they can be viable in the face of, of those changes. Thanks, Simone. So, Naveen, uh, same question to you. When India has seen a lot of collaborative efforts between startup and uh, uh, banks to evolve the fintech ecosystem, uh, obviously there are a lot of challenges. So what's your view on uh, India uh, uh, enterprise plumbing and how exactly and how smoothly is working right now? So uh, if I just go back into those three buckets, which I mentioned, right, because the challenges will be different. If you want to own a license today, uh, most foreign player most of the services, be it banking, payments, uh, insurance, lending, there are provisions where I think the regulation does allow for foreign ownership from, uh, let's say, 51% to 100%. There are some areas where they restrict below 26%, uh, especially the banking sector, uh, certain deposit taking, et cetera, but, and some specific insurance players. So if you really want to own, you could come directly take license, you could start business. Of course, the timelines to get the license, et cetera, could be the real challenge, the process of doing it, the time it takes, the, the diligence process, because there's very strong diligence process uh, with the regulators, right? And before giving a license. So that's the first bucket. But good news is that there are a lot of players already working with the licenses in India, be it payments, be it insurance, uh, in different capacities, right? The distribution plays a lot easier, which is where the real collaboration comes in. You could actually... So interesting piece in India is that there are enough partners available. Depending on your strategy, do you want to go and offer an existing large bank a service for their customers, or do you rather want to kind of take advantage of their licenses and abilities and rather reach out to a new customer? So both models are available and your customers or your partner choice would be different. Uh, interestingly, whether you're a large bank or a mid-sized bank or a, let's say progressive bank, today they are all open to FinTech partnerships. Of course, last about two to three years, the environment has changed. There was a time any fintech entity, even remotely interesting product, you could get the partnerships done in a year's time. But with some new policy changes in last year to two, it's become a bit tougher. It's become a lot more diligence oriented. Uh, it's not so easy, but it's still doable, uh, provided you're a, you're a high caliber, high quality company with the right solutions and compliance mindset. So the environment is, uh, let's say, slightly more compliance oriented, but you have a lot of choices. I mean, you have large banks like SDFC, SBI, to kind of... Uh, ICSA, we're all open to partners to a progressive banks like Yes Bank, RBL. So there are plenty of lists there. Even the, in other sectors, there are players, right? You have a NBFC, which is for lending, a very large player from a diversified NBFC, and there are thousands of them with the licenses. So again, depending on your objective, you have a choice. As I said, the common issues, the timeline is something where one has to work more closely and how much flexibility you get. Uh, last bucket is tech bucket, where if you have an interesting solution, you could actually go and market to both sides, to fintechs as well as these large institutions. It will depend on what kind of a solution you have. The sales cycles, again, because of the compliances in India, can vary from six months to at times year and a half. Because if you really have a deep solutions like, a let's say, a core banking or a card network, the audit and the security audit, security audit and the checks, and I think uh, uh, all three co-panelists have talked about some serious issues around the cyber uh, security, et cetera. So those checks have improved, the audits have improved or let's say become more stringent. But you have opportunity. The challenge is obviously the timeline. And uh, I would still say there is an opportunity. Uh, the only issue is predictability around the timelines and the roadmap and how fast you could get it done. 
and how you select it. So a lot depends on your strategy, how much you really know about the market, how intelligent you select your possible collaboration. I'll only end by saying that UPI is the greatest example of a collaboration in the country and probably globally today, where you have a government directly driving it, where you have a regulator supporting it, where you have a banks, multiple banks participating. You have, again, fintechs participating in distribution of the product, and you also have a big techs participating. So there cannot be a better model where it's a cohesive ecosystem coming together and the success is visible across the globe. Thanks, Naveen. Uh, it has been a great discussion. Uh, I'd love to continue. Unfortunately, we have some time restrictions here. So uh, we have a lot of questions coming up from the audience, so we'll address that offline. Uh, but uh, on behalf of FIS and behalf of all our audience, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone. Uh, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Lito. Thank you, Mickey. And thank you, Naveen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prasant. Nice meeting you, Simon, Lito, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. I think we